on, sing along. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross Well, good morning, Berean family. Welcome back to the uh, Berean Bible Church uh, sermon feed. So I'm glad that you found us again. Uh, if you're new to our uh, little sermon stream we've got going on here, my name is Jamie Merritt. I'm the lead pastor of Berean Bible Church, a multi-ethnic uh, church in Loganville, Georgia, and we're honored that you would join us this morning. As you're turning to Daniel chapter 7, that's where we're going to be this morning, Daniel chapter 7. Go ahead and get your Bibles out, if you will. Uh, let me just say, uh, as we record this now, this is actually uh, Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, and I know this weekend uh, all of our hearts and our minds, our attention has been focused on some of the events uh, that have happened in Atlanta, uh, the events that have surrounded uh, the killing of, of George Floyd. Uh, l- let me say this uh, from the beginning. If, if you're a Berean uh, member uh, or just a friend that's coming on late, uh, I made a statement about this, and we put it up on our uh, church Facebook page and also on our website. I would encourage you to go and read that just as a way that uh, we can handle this subject matter uh, biblically. Uh, we're trusting the Lord in all of this, but obviously our hearts are broken. We, we love our city. We love our community. We want to see justice done. And so my plea for us this morning as a church family is that uh, we would simply devote uh, much prayer uh, to this matter. We know our nation uh, has some serious racial tensions that continue to brew, and we need the Lord to come and, and solve those, not only through the gospel, but as we interact in our communities to love neighbors. So I hope and trust uh, that as Bereans, we'll do that well and do that in honor of, of the Lord there. So uh, that being said, Daniel chapter 7 Uh, Daniel chapter 7 is where we're going to be this morning. Let me share with you a little bit of a story. Uh, When I was growing up in the Merritt home as a kid, uh, we had a unique tradition, and that tradition was this. Every Halloween, uh, my dad would load us up in the car, and we would go down to Blockbuster Video. Now, right now, some of the parents may need to hit pause on this stream. You need to explain to your kids what Blockbuster Video even is. All these new kids and their fancy Netflix And uh, Disney Plus now, they have no idea the hope that you had going to Blockbuster only to find out your video was checked out and you couldn't watch it. But we had this tradition every Halloween. We would show up uh, and we would go around looking and and here's what dad would do. He He would go find some old school black and white horror movie back in the day, and we would watch it for Halloween. We'd pile on the couch, popcorn, snacks, the whole nine yards, and, and here are some of the movies that we watched uh, as I was a kid. The black and white versions of all of these things. The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Some of you may remember these stories. The Blob, The Thing, 
them, the swamp thing. Uh, and that was a great tradition we had. One of the traditions also was being uh, so scared to death, we ended up sleeping on the floor in mom and dad's room after the fact. But I wonder if you read Daniel 7, which I hope you have read Daniel 7 coming up to this point. Uh, it may feel like we're stepping into one of those old school horror flicks. The beasts that are mentioned, this kind of half creature, uh, half animal that we see here. It's amazing. We see these things all the time from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to Frankenstein. Uh, and here we are. Uh, and it's an amazing account. And really what we're dealing with as we get into uh, Daniel chapter 7 is what we call apocalyptic literature. Now somebody says, what, what is apocalyptic literature? Typically most people think it's very confusing. It's complex. All this mysterious imagery. Uh, but what we see really is apocalyptic literature is given in scripture for two reasons. Uh, number one, to reveal, and number two, to comfort. It's given to reveal things that are in the future. So apocalyptic literature, whether it's the second half of Daniel, Daniel 7 to 12, which we're going to see, or say a book like Revelation or whatever it is, it reveals something about the end times. It reveals something about uh, the kingdoms of this world coming to a conclusion and the new kingdom that God is going to bring coming into fruition. So it reveals those things, but also to comfort. Uh, always in these passages, it gives comfort to God's people because always, the church has always been under persecution. It's always suffered following Christ and being true to His Word. And so these two things are always going to be present. So here's what I hope as we enter this last section of Daniel. Most people never touch the second half. Most people just want the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or Daniel in the lion's den. But I didn't want to do that because all Scripture is given from the Lord. Uh, all is inspired. All is inerrant. And so we trust that God has a great word for us uh, even in these next few weeks as we come. So Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. We'll read all the way to verse 8 as we've always been doing. We will work through this entire passage, but we'll take it in chunks. All right, so here's beginning in verse 1. Here's what the Lord says to us. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream and he told the sum of the matter. And Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from out of the sea, different from one another, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then I looked and its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and it was made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and it was told, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped out what was left with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came from among them another horn, a little one, before, the three, of the, before three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like a man, and its mouth speaking great things. This is God's word. What is all this about? What in the world do we have here? Well, in this passage, we're going to see three truths that I think the Lord would have for us. And the first truth is this. When fear overwhelms, God is in control. When fear overwhelms, God is in control. If you notice how this passage begins, it begins with all of this imagery and language. In other words, Daniel is not so much trying to merely teach. He is doing that. But he's trying to set a mood I don't know if you picked up on that. He's trying to leave an impression. And here's the impression that Daniel wants to do in this passage. He's wanting to scare you like that ancient horror flick. He's wanting to not only scare you, he's wanting, in fact, to terrify you. That's exactly what's going on here. Did you notice the scene that he paints? So number one in verse two, it says that this was a vision at night. Have you ever noticed in every horror flick, 99% of the movie is always at night. 
right? Because scary things happen when it's dark and you can't see. Not only that, it says he happened uh, while he was standing on the shoreline. The, the four winds began to stir and the sea became, became stirred up. Now, here's what's going on with that. Ancient times, uh, the sea was a picture of chaos and disorder and fear. You've got a a hurricane-like storm that's being stirred up. And as this is being stirred up, it's at nighttime. The hurricane winds, he's on there. One at a time, these horrific, horrific beasts begin to come out. And so as this is being portrayed, you and I are intended to be scared. We're intended to be fearful of what's going on here. Because what are we learning about these beasts? Well, number one, they're enormous predators, right? They're terrifying. Notice in all of these, they're perversions of God's creation. God hasn't made a lion with wings or he hasn't made this kind of beast with ten horns. These are perversions of God's creation. Uh, Not only that, each one goes from bad to worse. Again, the scene that he's presenting here, it's like something that you've never encountered in your worst nightmare. That's what Daniel's trying to give to us. So you've got a part lion, part eagle that's a predator. You've got a deformed bear that's on one side that has ribs in its mouth. In other words, the picture there is like the old uh, Guns N' Roses album, album. Appetite for destruction. Uh, This bear has an appetite for destruction to devour all in its flesh. You've got a leopard there with four heads and wings. Now think about this. A leopard is ferocious enough because you can't outrun a leopard. But what about a leopard with wings? You can't run from this guy. right? He has four heads, meaning he sees in the four different directions. You can't hide from him. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to go. Each is getting worse and worse. And then all of a sudden you get to this fourth beast and there's no categories for this guy. I mean, how do you describe what's described here? He's devouring everything in his flesh. He has ten horns, which is a picture of strength. So in the Old Testament, you also hear things like uh, the horn of Judah, the horn of Israel. Right? These are a picture of strength. So when it says he has ten horns, notice it's strength times five the normal animal would have. Right, So this is a picture that evokes fear, terror. And uh, the funny thing that I was thinking this week, even about this whole scene, do you remember the first time you ever saw The Wizard of Oz? Do you remember watching that movie and all of a sudden the flying monkeys appear? And you were so freaked out by the flying monkeys. Church, those were flying monkeys. Uh, We're talking about flying beasts, flying animals, flying leopards. It's almost like Daniel would say, hold my sweet tea. Because apparently Daniel was a Baptist. If he was Presbyterian, I'm sure he'd have another beverage that he would have passed our way, right? But that's for a whole other story. But the point is, all of this is this kind of terrifying imagery of what's going on. Now somebody says, okay, well, what in the world is all this about? Why is Daniel giving us this? Look down at verses 16 and 17. We hear what this is. So Daniel says, I approached one of those who stood there and I asked him the truth concerning all of this. And he said to me, and he made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are for kings who shall rise out of the earth. In other words, these beasts represent kingdoms. It represents nations. And we know this today. Think about it. The, the United States is known for what? What's our kind of emblem? A bald eagle, right? Right? Russia has forever been known as this kind of ferocious bear. We see this all the time. Uh, And what we see in this passage, more than likely, there's some uncertainty on who these beasts are. But I want you to think about something. We're pretty sure, probably speaking, that the first beast is Babylon. Because it reminds us so much of what we already know from Babylon. Number one, Jeremiah and Ezekiel refer to Babylon as both a lion and an eagle. Notice when it talks about his wings being plucked off, it reminds us of Nebuchadnezzar and the humiliation that he faced, the humiliation that he went through and how God gave him the mind of a man and restored him from a beast to a man. But here's the thing. We don't know about the others, although it seems like when you get to verses 7 and 8, the final beast, in Revelation 13, uh, John talks about another beast that comes out of the sea. And the beast that comes out of the sea is a combination of a lion, a bear, a leopard, and it has ten horns. And it's led by a figure that we all probably know if you've grown up in church, a figure by the name of the Antichrist. So what we're seeing at least is probably the first beast here is Babylon. And what it seems to appear is the last beast is we're talking the end of time, the last kingdom that's being built up that comes in to destroy and wreak havoc and all of these kinds of things uh, that are going on here. But here's the point. 
the point of this passage is not for us to spend all this time trying to figure out who are these kingdoms, who are they representing, because that's not what's going on. We can sometimes get into all this and we miss the forest for the trees. Rather, what we're seeing is this. It's a picture of all the earthly kingdoms. God is giving us a vantage point to see all the kingdoms of this earth. And, and how does God see them? He sees them as violent, cruel beasts that devour those in its wake. They, they devour those. They're murderous. They devour the innocent. They devour God's people. God's people suffer as all of this. And this is exactly what Daniel has known in his own history. Babylon has come in to conquer God's people, to haul them off. So many were murdered and ruined. And this is, again, throughout all of church history, we see the destruction that nation states wreak on the church. Okay, but what, what's the point of all of this? Notice this. And here's where, where we're saying when fear overwhelms, God is in control. Did you notice there in verse 4, it says this, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted from the ground. Who was doing that? Who plucked off these wings and lifted it from the ground? What about this in verse 5 down there? The bear was told, it was told, arise, devour much flesh. Who, who is giving the bear commands? Or, or what about this one here down at the bottom, down in verse 6? It says that the leopard that had uh, four heads, that dominion was given to it. Who gave dominion? Who gave authority to this beast? And here's the silent hope in this passage is, and this is what we know, church, that throughout church history we know this, that God is sovereignly in control. Even though we see throughout human history, nation after nation, cruelty after cruelty, beastly beastly monstrosities of injustice and cruelty that behind it all in some way, shape, or form, God is sovereignly steering stuff. And, and we don't know how this works, church. Understand, it's that picture that God is sovereign, but he's not in the evil and the suffering. Think, think about this. There's a, a passage in Acts chapter 2 where Peter is preaching at Pentecost, and here's what he says. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. He's speaking about the cross and the crucifixion. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders, this Jesus, listen to this, delivered up according to the, de to, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Did you hear that? On the one hand, this was according to the definite plan and purposes of God. God ordained this event, the most evil event in human history. On the other hand, though God ordained it and planned it, Peter says, you men crucified him. You did this. Behind everything in this world is a sovereign God. And what that does is, church, it, it gives us calm and peace of knowing. Somehow in all of this, whether it's a global pandemic, whether it's rioting, whether it's injustice, of all these situations that we've seen in our community, in our culture, in our nation, globally in the world, we know this, that somehow, church, we hold on to this fact that behind it all, there's a scene. Evil is on a leash. God is in control. God is working and doing what He needs to do. So, when fear overwhelms, God is in control. Here's the second truth. When evil rules, God is on His throne. When evil rules, God is on His throne. Look at verses 9 and 10. As I look, Daniel writes, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took His seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head was pure like wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. And a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened." Here's what I love about Daniel 7. As soon as we get this picture of dehabilitating fear and anxiety, all of a sudden the scene shifts. Daniel's vision transforms him. It takes him from this vision of the earth and the beasts that are on the earth to the throne room of God. Evil seems to be winning on the earth, but all of a sudden Daniel gets a vision of God seated on his throne. And we learn several things about God, and we learn this. If we know nothing else from this passage, here's what we need to see. That God is on his throne. In spite of the atrocities and justice, God sits on his throne, and he rules. What do we learn about God's rule in this passage? A number of things. Number one, God rules in wisdom. 
God rules in wisdom. This phrase, ancient of days, did you know Daniel is the only Old Testament writer that refers to God as the ancient of days? Literally, he is the one advanced in age. He's being described as an aged man. An elderly man, which seems bizarre to us because in the Western culture, uh, we don't honor age. We despise it. We glamorize youth and we despise the elderly. But that's not what we see in the scriptures and it's not what we see in the Eastern context. Rather, uh, God is not frail. He's grand. God is not foolish. He's wise. God is not senile. He has dignity. And the, the, the picture for us is to see that God is all wise and he's sitting ruling on his throne. Friend, I wonder this morning, uh, do, you, do you have the ability to look in the world, maybe at all the injustice, maybe at all the evil and the suffering, and, and do you have the ability to look with faith to see Christ and God on his throne and to say this, that I trust that God is wise and his ways are best? I may not understand what's going on. I may not understand his plans and his purposes. But God knows best. He is wise. He is far advanced from what I can see and what I know. So God is, he rules in wisdom. The second thing we see is God rules in peace. I love this. The ancient of days, what does it say? He took his seat. Notice this, church. Uh, The kingdoms of this world are always in a panic. The kingdoms of this world are always frantically running around trying to figure out who's conquering them, who's coming against them. Look here. God is never caught off guard. God is never surprised. God is never in a panic. God is never pacing back and forth, upset, somehow uh, mystified at what's going on around the world. Rather, it's a picture of utter calm, utter peace, and all of these things. Friend, when you draw close to God you cannot help that peace to rub off on you. When you know that God rules and reigns on his throne, no matter what we see around us in the world, we have peace in our hearts. No wonder Jesus said in John 14, listen to what Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Can I invite you this morning to trust and rest. The king that rules and reigns right now on his throne offers peace. He rules in peace. So he rules in wisdom. He rules in peace. Third, God rules in judgment. He rules in judgment. One of the things that we ought to see in this passage, not only is this a throne room with a king, this is a courtroom with a judge. I don't know if you picked up on that. Look at again at verses 9 and 10 down at the bottom there. Notice how it talks about his throne was one of fiery flames. And burning fire. Fire is always a picture of judgment in the Bible. A stream of fire issued forth. And then notice at the very end of verse 10, it says this. The court sat in judgment and books were opened. Here's the the picture, friend. The world that we know is unjust, corrupt, uh, and brutal. It is beastly in what we see in our communities around the world. What we see even in our own country these last few days and weeks. But make no mistake, justice is coming. God will keep his day. God will have his way in the end of all of this. And this is what's encouraging to us. Listen, we we live in a world right now that riots because they feel like they have no hope. Christian, we have a better answer because we know that God will one day set this world right. Do we not? Is this not what we see? So we may see injustice in Hong Kong, China... But God will set things right because his books are true. We may see injustice in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But God's book is opened and he keeps tabs on everything. We may see injustice in Moscow, Russia or Brunswick, Georgia. But God rules and reigns and his justice, his books are opened and he sees and knows everything. And he will set things right. And so church, here's what we can do in the meantime. We can trust God. We say what needs to be said. We stand in faithfulness to call for justice. We stand in faithfulness to stand up for persecuted brothers and sisters, whether that's a persecuted church or whether that's neighbors and friends and and, and, and minority brothers and sisters in our communities. But here's what we do. We call for justice and then we allow God to rule and reign on whatever happens. Injustice is what rules our world. But true justice is coming one day when the Lord comes. So God rules in wisdom. He rules in peace. God rules in judgment. Fourth, God rules in Jesus. 
He rules in Jesus. Now, here's an amazing statement. I don't know if you picked up on it. Look at, down at verse 13 and 14. Daniel says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, I'm cheating here a little bit when I say that uh, God rules in Jesus because clearly Daniel wouldn't have seen Jesus He would have seen a mysterious figure that he didn't quite understand. All he could describe him was he was like a son of man, and yet he was divine. His qualities weren't like a normal man. His qualities were divine. I don't know if you picked up on these. So number one, he's divine because he rides on clouds. If you look through the Old Testament, uh, God rides on the clouds. Men don't ride on the clouds. It's a picture of divinity. So in Psalm 68 and Isaiah 19, this is what we hear. So this unique feature is divine because like God, he rides on the clouds. Like God, he's given authority. He has authority. He has power. He has glory. He's worshipped by every tribe, tongue, and nation in this passage. So think about it this way. You've got the beast that are perversions of God's created order. Now all of a sudden we see this true man, this perfect man. In other words, we're to get a picture. Here's a man that all of us should have been But we failed to be him because of our sin and because of our own perversions to this. And yet, uh, we're reminded that this is a picture even of Jesus. Daniel wouldn't have seen it, but we do. Here's why. Because, did you know this? That of all the titles given to Christ and the Messiah and, and, and all of these pictures that we see, do you know Jesus' favorite title of himself was the Son of Man that he gets right here from Daniel 7? Over 81 times in the gospel... The Son of Man title is used to give to Jesus. How ironic. It's ironic because when we look at this, we think, okay, God is ruling in wisdom and peace and justice. And yet, we look around at the world and we don't think that. We, we look around at the injustice that we've seen these last few weeks and around the world and we say, listen, I, how can we trust? How can we trust that really... God rules specifically. How can we trust that really Christ sits on his throne amidst all of this? And, and this is what I love. If you go to Mark 14, Mark 14, 61 and 62 is the crucifixion scene. And Jesus is actually on trial for his life. And here's what Mark records. He says, but Jesus remained silent and he gave no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Finally, Jesus speaks. Here's what he says. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming on the clouds of heaven. Now notice what Jesus has just done. Notice this. If you look at Daniel 7, the Son of Man that comes is a divinely human figure that comes to rule and reign and to squelch the kingdoms of the earth. But Jesus first applies this category to his death burial, and resurrection. Jesus takes the Son of Man, and it's a position of humility, suffering, injustice, and trial. This is what we see in this picture here. The Son of Man, Mark goes on to say, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. This is how we know that Jesus Christ rules and reigns. Because historically, objectively, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We know that right now Christ owns it all. He controls it all. He, in fact, sits on his throne because, friend, when the, when the Romans crucified him and when the religious leaders crucified him, he rose from the dead. You and I can rest assured that because he rose from the dead, we have evidence, we have proof that Jesus Christ right now, in spite of the appearances, in spite of how it looks, he rules. So, when fear overwhelms, God is in control. When evil rules... God is on his throne. Here's the third truth that we see in this passage. When anxiousness remains, God's kingdom will prevail. When anxiousness remains, God's kingdom will prevail. Look at verse 15 and then down at 28. In verse 15 it says this, As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. Drop down to verse 28. Here is the end of the matter. 
As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Here's what's amazing to me in this passage. Even a supernatural vision from God is not enough to overcome Daniel's fears and anxieties. Daniel sees clearly what God is saying to him. Isn't that amazing that sometimes we can see what God says in his word and it almost creates more anxiety, more fear, more concern in all of this. It's, it's going to take more than a number of glances at the throne room of God to, to squelch our fear and anxieties. You know, we're talking about God's sovereignty and he rules and he reigns. But friend, there, there are evils in this world. There is injustice in this world that is so horrific the Bible is pulling the curtains back on this. It is wanting us to see these realities for what they are. Daniel, in all of this, sees and knows, and yet his anxiety levels are still heightened. His anxiety levels are still there. And, and what's amazing to, to you and I, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing to me because, again, we go to passages like this and we end up being like Daniel. Did you pick up on this that even in the midst of all of that, Daniel wanted to know, okay, tell me about this fourth beast, this beast at the very end that's going to come before uh, God comes to put his kingdom into place. So look again at verses 16 to 21. Let's end here and, and talk about this kingdom that God is putting in. Daniel writes this, As for me, uh, Daniel, uh, my spirit was anxious and the visions of my heads alarmed me. I approached one who stood there and I asked him about the truth concerning all of this. And he told me and he made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Now listen to this. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the others and the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth and iron claws and, and claws made of bronze, of which devoured and broke into pieces and stamped what was left with its feet and about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up before. And there were three of them that fell and the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. What's amazing to me is Daniel's seeing all that and he's basically saying, okay, listen, uh, tell me about this beast. Isn't this how we are? So many Christians are obsessed with end times and this is where we get into trouble because what happens is uh, to scratch that itch, so many pastors and preachers and commentators, they start filling out charts and nations and they start speculating on each of these kingdoms and who they represent and the ten horns are these kingdoms and the three kings are these kings and, and we go on and on. But did you notice that's the opposite of what happens here? What happens here, uh, it's almost like the angel, when Daniel asks him and says, okay, explain this to me, the, the angel basically says to him, Daniel, miss, you're missing the point. Daniel, yes, the little horn is going to come to assault God's people. Yes, it's going to be a horrific time. But Daniel, did you hear what I said? God's people win in the end. God's kingdom is established. They get the, the kingdom forever and forever and forever. That's what he says in verse 14 or in verse 18 there. So in essence, I think what we see is this. Daniel's life always known as persecution, suffering trials from all of these atrocities. But God wants Daniel to know and us to know. This is what we will see throughout human history. Things will not get better. Things will continue to get worse. It's a hard word. It really is, church. No wonder John says in 1 John 2.18, he says this, Dear children, this is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. But even now, many Antichrists have come. And this is how we know that it's the last hour. In other words, when you look at the Scripture, th the point is this. All of these pictures that we see throughout human history from Joseph Stalin to Adolf Hitler, to Pol Pot, to the Rwandan genocide, all of these things that we see throughout human history, antichrist after antichrist after antichrist, suffering after suffering after suffering. But what do we see in verse 26 and 27? But the court shall sit in judgment, his dominion, the Lord's dominion, or I'm sorry, his dominion being that the, the fourth beast shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom... And the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom 
shall be an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. All the kingdoms of this earth shall pass. And you and I, as God's people, shall rule and reign with Christ. That's the hope that we see in Daniel chapter 7. That's the hope that we see in this passage. So here's the point. There are far worse things in this world than suffering unjustly. God has called us to be faithful. He's called us to fix our eyes on the throne room of Christ and to be ready for Him in the end. So that's the question for us. Berean family, are we ready? Are we being faithful? If the Lord tarries and another kingdom comes and another kingdom comes and injustice comes and beastly activity after beastly activity, we want to know this, church. Will we be faithful and will we be ready? Christ rules, He reigns, and the point of Daniel 7 is, again, it is pointing us back to Jesus to see this. He rules and reigns. And what I love about this, why why are we surprised when we see kingdoms and nation states acting beastly and they look like perversions of what God created? Because when you look at the Scriptures, here's what we see. Every heart is like this. My heart included. We, We are born into sin. Nebuchadnezzar's story of his pride and him turning to a beast is, is every story. It's our story because of our sin, because of our pride. We've looked like beasts. We no longer look like what God created us to be. But because Jesus came and he suffered and he died on a cross and he stood in our place, he took our punishment on the cross, now the true man comes to set things right, comes to put his kingdom in place. He invites us to into his kingdom and this is what we know. His kingdom is coming without a doubt. So when fear remains, when fear remains, God is in control. When evil rules, God sits on his throne. And when the anxiousness remains, church, we can be assured that God's kingdom will prevail and it will come. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you now. So grateful, Lord, that in the midst of an unjust world, cruel world, beastly world, Father, we trust and we rest in you. Father, I pray right now for our community, our broader Atlanta community, our nation, Minneapolis, places of this world like Detroit right now, uh, Father, in our country that are suffering under the riots and unrest of the people that are there. Father, we pray your peace. Father, we pray in some way that Christ and the gospel will rule and reign in every heart and life as it rules right here at Berean. Father, I pray that you would use our church in this moment like you used Daniel Let us be faithful, Lord. We may not be huge. We may not be numerous in in how many people we have coming. But, Lord, like Daniel, that was just one. We want to be faithful to you. So, Father, we're grateful for Christ. We want to invite you into this presence, into this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, let me say thank you for joining us again, as always. I would love to talk to you more. If you have questions about what it means to know Christ and have a relationship with me, you can contact us through the church Facebook page that you're streaming this through. You can contact us through the church website, the Berean Bible Church in Loganville, Georgia. You can find us there. Uh, We'd love to contact you. Till then, uh, church family, uh, don't forget Berean members. We've got a family meeting tonight uh, at 5 p.m. I hope you can join us Sunday night. 5 p.m. Join us there. We're going to have that family meeting. Uh, We look forward to seeing you there. VBS is starting the month of June. Uh, Every Sunday night or every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. and following, our VBS is going to be going on. You still have time to register, parents, if you haven't. Uh, We'd love to see your kids at our virtual VBS through Zoom. Uh, But till then, uh, we're honored uh, that you watched this morning. Trust that the Lord is blessing, and we will see you next time. God bless.